Boston police officer was shot. An attempted murder of a Boston police officer. That's serious business. A young African-American male is arrested. And they told him he was gonna be going away for a long time. The man claims he's innocent, but there's scientific evidence against him. It was a very powerful piece of evidence. That, to me, was always questionable. Years later, can a team of lawyers challenge a forensic science that's nearly a century old? Even evidence that people regard as the most reliable can be an error. Officer Gregory Gallagher is on duty patrolling an urban Boston neighborhood. He notices an African-American male lurking suspiciously on the sidewalk. Officer Gallagher calls out to the man. Sergeant Gallagher observed an individual uh, that he attempted to stop and question. Instead of complying, the man edges away, then breaks into a sprint. Officer Gallagher leaps out of his car and he gives chase. They eventually ended up in a backyard, one of the streets in Jamaica Plain, and uh, Officer Gallagher attempted to apprehend the individual. As the officer approaches, the man lunges at his throat. The two scuffle, and the man grabs Gallagher's gun from its holster. Gallagher turns to flee. The man opens fire, wildly. The assailant then fired um, about a dozen shots at Sergeant Gallagher as he was trying to escape. A couple of bullets find their mark. He was shot twice, once in the buttocks. That bullet exited his leg, and then the second shot that hit him in the back was stopped by a bulletproof vest and likely saved his life. Wounded but alive, the officer scales the fence and scrambles to safety. A neighborhood resident is watching the commotion from a second story window. As you look down on the fight between Sergeant Gallagher and the assailant, the assailant shoots up towards the window, just missing the onlooker. Then the perpetrator flees, leaving behind a big Still brandishing the gun, the perpetrator ducks into a nearby home to hide from the police. Inside the house, the man confronts a frightened mother trying to protect her children. The man looks agitated. Those white policemen, he says, they're after me. She asks him to put down his gun. He took off a, a sweatshirt that he was wearing. He wiped down the sergeant's service revolver. He then asks the woman for a glass of water. He drinks the water and puts the mug down on the kitchen table. He exits the home, leaving behind his sweatshirt, the gun, and the glass mug. The woman immediately contacts the police. But it's too late to track down the intruder. At that point, there was a huge or large crowd that would gather at the crime scene. He slipped into that crowd and was able to make good his escape. Local police immediately begin their investigation. They collect the cap left at the crime scene and evidence of the home the assailant entered, including the glass mug he drank from. The Boston Police Department expresses its outrage at the attack. Officer Gallagher makes an appeal on TV. I'm asking all my friends and uh, contacts I've had over the years uh, working here, any help you can give us would be greatly appreciated. Meanwhile, the police comb the neighborhood where the attack occurred. The Boston police were sweeping the neighborhood, basically going door to door, trying to find the perpetrator. One individual questioned, suggested that the Boston police talk to Stefan Cowens because he was a popular guy and he might know something, not because he might be a suspect. 
but the police are looking for a suspect. And 27-year-old Stefan Cowens fits the bill. He is a petty thief with a criminal record, and he has outstanding warrants for larceny and shoplifting. Officers track Cowens down at a bus stop in Eagleston Square and arrest him. I was approached by Boston police and told that I had a warrant for receiving stolen property. Um, I didn't resist anything because I only owed three months of warrant, so they ended up arresting me. For the Boston police, the search is over. For Stefan Cowens, the nightmare is about to begin. At the police station, Cowens is booked, fingerprinted, and questioned, but not about his warrant. Next thing I know, I was speaking to homicide detectives, and the homicide detectives asked me, what do I think I'm up here for? And I told them, well, the only reason I can think of is because, you know, the police officer got shot. Stefan tells the detectives he happened to be driving through the neighborhood the day of the shooting. I'm thinking they just want to ask me questions. Do I know anything? Do I see anything? Then the questioning takes a turn. It was more like the finger started being pointed at me. Finally, the detectives tell Cowens they suspect he shot Officer Gregory Gallagher to evade a shoplifting warrant. Stefan had a record, but he was a violent person. He was a sort of the guy in the neighborhood who sold the fake Calvin Klein hats and the Gucci bags. People don't just overnight become horrible, violent people that shoot cops not that type of person at all. He's never been that type of person. But the detectives say they have indisputable scientific proof that Cowens is guilty. There was a fingerprint recovered, his fingerprint from a glass that he was allegedly drinking out of. The fingerprint was discovered on that mug, and that fingerprint belonged to Stephen Cowens. Cowens is charged with shooting Officer Gallagher. He was arrested based on the fingerprint identification, in particular, finger number six, which is the left thumb. We didn't understand how do you hold a cup and you only have a thumbprint on there. Cowan spends the night in jail and is arraigned the next morning. His bail is set at half a million dollars. And by that time, Stefan called me. Tears flying everywhere. He didn't do it. He didn't do it from the whole, the first day of the arrest. We're like, what is, what is their problem? They need to get it together and find uh, who shot this man because Stefan didn't do it. But the evidence against Cowens keeps mounting. Officer Gallagher examines a photo spread and identifies Cowens as the man who shot him. Then Gallagher and the eyewitness from the second story window pick him out of a lineup. Both individuals, Sergeant Gallagher and the a witness identified Stephen Cowens as the perpetrator. The case goes to trial in 1998, where the victimized officer confronts Cowens from the witness stand. I have no doubt that you meant to kill me, Mr. Cowens. So today, I'm not asking justice just for myself, but for all the men and women who serve in the city of Boston Police Department and throughout the Commonwealth. The evidence against Cowens seems overwhelming. Two police fingerprint analysts testify that the thumbprint on the glass mug left by the perpetrator belongs to Stefan Cowens. And these two analysts at the Boston Police Department uh, uh, fingerprint unit claimed that there were 16 points of identity between the fingerprint from finger number six found on the mug and Stefan Cowens. That made that fingerprint beyond a perfect match for my fingerprint. Putting aside for the moment the fingerprint in this case, the um, two, the victim, Sergeant Gallagher, and a witness both identified Mr. Cowens. If I was on the jury, I probably would have convicted me too. The jury returns the verdict. Guilty. Stefan Cowens is convicted of home invasion and assault and battery with intent to kill. I'm very happy with the outcome of the case. One week later, he is sentenced. 35 to 50 years in jail. That's what you get when you're convicted of shooting a police officer. When they were sentencing him, all I could think was my baby would be 55 years old when he come out of jail and 
It was just devastating. Just devastating. After the heartbreaking sentence is delivered, Cowens faces his accuser one final time. But you know, as well as I know, I'm not the man who did this to you, okay? Calgary does not respond. That, that might as well have been a life sentence that they gave my cousin. Cowens is led from the courtroom in shackles. They just shuffled me away with the shackles too tight around my ankles, and then I hear my mother crying, and they you can't tell your mother's gonna be all right because she knows it's not gonna be all right. Stefan Cowens continues to assert his innocence, but it would take years before Stefan finds the only people who have the ability to help him get out. They are the Innocence Project, a team of lawyers whose life's work is trying to free the innocent. But will they be able to help Stefan? When I first started learning about Stefan's case, I had uh, real concerns. Everyone in prison is innocent. I mean, you know, those sorts of things are all going through your head. Stefan persists that the wrong man is in jail, but the odds have stacked against him. When we return. Are we pleased with it? Um, justice prevails, and uh, being involved in the criminal justice system myself for so long, it, it, it does work. sentenced to 35 to 50 years in prison for shooting a Boston cop, a crime he swears he did not commit. But the evidence against him seems overwhelming. The victim's eyewitness identification and fingerprint left on the crime scene that matches his. You know, I'm in the papers, I'm in, you know, I'm splashed all over the place being, being accused of, you know, this horrific crime, you know, it's, it, it, you know, it was horrifying. It was a nightmare to me. Big night. You just don't know what a nightmare it was. I, I just told my lawyer, I just kept saying, you know, put in my appeal, put in my appeal. But Safan's lawyer was a disappointment from the beginning. He never came to talk to me after my trial. He never came and explained to me what just happened. He would make promises to go and see Safan. I, then instead of him showing up, he was sent as paralegal. It was just, it was just a mess. It was a disaster from the beginning. Stefan didn't have any witnesses on his behalf. I don't think he much believed me what I was saying. And there were inconsistencies in Stefan's case that were never resolved. Apparently, before he was even questioned, there had been uh, photographs of him shown to uh, Officer Gallagher. According to police records, Officer Gallagher originally made a tentative identification of Cowens and only became more positive as time went on. It's not like, like you know, you're making up your mind about buying a piece of candy. You were talking about a person who allegedly shot you. And even more disconcerting, the woman whose home the gun entered could not identify Stefan and Cowens as the perpetrator. The individuals who spent the most time with the perpetrator did not identify Stefan Cowens as the perpetrator. The woman kept saying Steph she couldn't pick Stefan out because he wasn't the one, he wasn't the one, but nobody listened. It certainly was a big question mark, but it wasn't enough when faced with the testimony of the officer the other witness and the fingerprint to result in a not guilty verdict. Stefan's new home, Sousa Baranowski Correctional Facility in Shirley, Massachusetts, a maximum security prison which houses almost 2,000 inmates. Alone in his cell, Stefan keeps replaying what's happened to him with a sense of disbelief. How could they have possibly matched my fingerprint to a glass I never touched? It must be just so astonishing to suddenly find yourself accused uh, uh, based on a fingerprint when you know you didn't do it. 35 
25 to 50 years. And this is a, a big, terrible nightmare, you know. There's nothing I wish on anyone. Cowens realizes he's likely to spend the next three or four decades behind bars for a crime he did not commit. Once they say they have your fingerprint, you know, you cannot change a person's mind. And I tried to make it seem like I believed that he was going to get out, but I didn't believe he was going to get out. I didn't think he was going to come out. But Stefan's mother believes in him and keeps fighting. My son has been unjustly killed. Excuse us. And the person who shot him is still out there. And she was so angry and so bitter. She just couldn't believe it. If it had been a black cop got shot, would they accuse an innocent white man for doing it? No. She knew her child was innocent. She used all the energy she could to support Stefan. That was her mission, you know to see Stefan get out of jail because she knew that he was in there for something that he didn't do and she just couldn't stand that. Stefan realizes he must make a choice, accept his fate in prison living one day at a time, or spend each day fighting to get out. In, in jail, right, there's, there's, there's two lifestyles. It's either you live the lifestyle of trying to get out of prison, or you live the lifestyle of living in prison. When you're living in prison, that means you're involved in the prison activities like playing basketball, playing cards, gambling, all the things that that is not benefiting you. A lot of people would just give up hope and, you know, become worse or not care or give up. And he did the exact opposite. I'm gonna find a key to get me out of here one day. Stefan knows he will need money to help prove his innocence. One of the CEOs came to me one day, she said, um, Cowens, I got a job for you, but you, it's, it's a real messy job. Yeah, I was like, I don't care, what, what is it? You know, I'll do it, you know? The job meant he might be awakened in the middle of the night to scrub down a blood-splattered cell. I think it was this guy who tried to commit suicide. So my first night, I spent like three hours cleaning this cell. Stefan puts up with the job for only one reason. It pays $3 a day. $3 a day. $21 a week. In jail, it's a lot of money. It's good money. Stefan Cowens also earns his graduate equivalency diploma and gets a court-appointed lawyer to handle his appeal. This time, Stefan promises himself things with his new lawyer will be different. I told myself once I get my new appeals attorney, I was going to establish a relationship with him, you know, uh, a personal relationship, whereas you know, I didn't, I didn't have with my paid attorney at trial, you know. But Stefan faces an unexpected challenge with his new lawyer. He really didn't believe me. Like, it was like, you know, I've heard this before, you know, everybody in jail is innocent, you know, that type of, that type of story. He wasn't optimistic like I was about the whole situation. I kind of, like, gave up hope, whereas he still had hope. So I'm still trying to sweet this guy like listen man listen to me I'm trying to tell you I'm innocent but Stefan knows if he's going to fight the legal system he needs to understand the law he spent time in the law library he made sure he understood many many things that many lawyers don't understand about fingerprints when other people play cards I was reading law he's like these guys get 20 years and they just sit back and take it I'm getting out his hard work pays off Stefan's lawyer begins to listen so finally he started like paying more and more attention because the more I studied in the law library, I was presenting him with things like, man, look at this and look at that. As I researched and sent him stuff, you know, he, he really started taking it serious. Stefan was persistent, was very focused on his case. And for his appeal, Stefan's lawyer resurrects a key piece of evidence that was not hammered home at his original trial. Conflicting eyewitness testimony from the woman whose home she was just like, that's not him, that's not the person I remember seeing. And that was a big gaping hole in the prosecutor's case. Finally, some progress. Stefan's lawyer gets the home invasion charge dropped. 
knocking 15 years off his sentence. But even with the reduced sentence, Stefan Cowan still faces up to 35 years in prison for a crime he did not commit. Probably because of the fingerprint. That fingerprint just haunted me. It really made me psychologically entertain the thought that I might have had pulled this off in my sleep or what, you know what I'm saying? It, it had me thinking like that. When we return, can a team of lawyers and students unlock the mystery of a man fingered with a print? Stefan Cowens has served three years in prison for a crime he knows he did not commit. He appeals his case and gets a sentence reduced. But the court still upholds the convictions for armed assault with intent to kill. His fingerprint was on the glass. The fingerprint was just a slam dunk against Stefan. But Stefan is determined to prove his innocence. He spends day after day studying the law and looking for help anywhere he can. I had started seeing things on innocent people and um, on TV and stuff. And I'm there showing innocent people getting out of prison and stuff and how the DNA was coming into play and stuff like that. Then it hits him. So they got my mind erased. I'm like, well, they said they had DNA in my case. Stefan begins learning everything he can about DNA. And I was reading this article on Barry Sheck and Peter Newfield and how they had started an organization called The Innocent Project in New York. The Innocence Project, a team of lawyers and law students dedicated to using DNA evidence to try to exonerate the wrongfully imprisoned. From St. Luke's Hospital. Cinema big thick packet of everything that happened in my case even though you're not supposed to send them that I send it to him anyway it's really quite a remarkable case actually Barry Sheck wrote me back and he said well um we're gonna send you a question there and I'm saying well they railroaded him once before now what are they gonna do I'm like I hope this lawyer is some good but he was saying no these these people are works on you they're they this is what they do they get innocent people out you know the Innocence Project refers to Bond's case to their New England regional office. Over the years, they've received so many letters and so much interest by individuals around the country who claim to be innocent that a bunch of regional projects have sprouted. So we call it loosely defined an innocence network. The Bond's appellate lawyer contacts the New England Innocence Project. The lawyer said to us when he called, I believe we, I have a client who may in fact be innocent. I'm handling his appeal, but do you think DNA can help him? At first, the New England lawyers are skeptical. I had some doubts about whether Stefan was in fact innocent. One of the key pieces of evidence used against Stefan at trial was a fingerprint, which two officers testified matched him and was found at the scene of the crime. Before DNA testing, fingerprints was the gold standard of forensic science. But I thought that even if Stefan might be innocent, I had real doubts about whether DNA could prove it. But despite their doubts, the Innocence Project takes on the case. We try not to prejudge. We try not to reject a case simply based on what the file looks like at, at our first review. Um, all that we really do is try to find out, is there DNA available for testing? And in this case, that presents a challenge. The only people whose opinion... And this was a hard one. This wasn't a case where there was a rape kit or some, you know, pool of blood from the perpetrator. This was, this was going to be a challenge. But we decided, yeah, there, there might be some evidence on a couple of items that would help prove Stefan's innocence. And there's the hat that was found, and sweat on the headband of the hat was swabbed. And the other items, the glass, the sweatshirt, the gun, all left at um, the home with the family. And the police knew enough to swab the rim of the mug for saliva that would come from the assailant. Rob Feldman contacts the prosecution's office regarding Stefan's DNA evidence. But they adamantly refuse to relinquish it. It's, you know, 
you're crazy, he committed the crime, there's a fingerprint. <laughs> Both Boston police technicians reported back to us that Stephen Cowan's fingerprint was in the mug. Long considered infallible, fingerprints have been used in courtrooms to make positive identifications for nearly a century. It's typically such powerful evidence at a trial because, you know, as jurors sit there and hear that there's been a fingerprint match, it's, it's really an open and shut case in many instances. Your fingerprint is like your personal identification. It's like once you're, it's found somewhere, there's no way it couldn't have been you. But the Innocence Project believes DNA evidence will trump the fingerprint if they can just get their hands on it. They have evidence. They don't want to test it. But they're saying it's mine, you know? And for Stefan Cowens, getting access to his evidence takes a new sense of urgency. His mother has become seriously ill and is scheduled for open heart surgery. And after she had the first heart attack, they didn't know why. So they were stress related. She was on a list of a heart transplant for three years and that never materialized. And just the sound of open heart surgery was enough to bring tears to my eyes. Racing time. The New England Innocence Project keeps pressing forward. She had a very, very strong belief in her son's innocence, and that helped us as Stefan's lawyers. We were really focusing on just getting anything where there could possibly be DNA. One response we were often given is that, look, the guy's fingerprint shows up at the scene. DNA ain't gonna help him. But we believed if we could get DNA from the hat that the perpetrator was wearing, which was found in one backyard, and get DNA from the glass that the perpetrator drank from at the other home, the next door neighbor's home, and those two items had this DNA from the same person, and if that person was not Stefan Cowens, we've exonerated Stefan and we now have the DNA of the actual perpetrator. And then, a small but crucial step for Stefan Cowens. Once we played out that scenario for the Suffolk County District Attorney's Office, there was a long pause on the phone. And they said, okay, if that happens, you've got something there. The Innocence Project persuades the DA to turn over some of Stefan's DNA evidence for testing. They told us we couldn't test the fingerprint. We only could test the DNA. In the summer of 2003, testing gets underway, and time is of the essence. It will take eight weeks before the test results come back. Stefan calls his mother and tells her to hang on. She's like, don't cry, I'm gonna be all right. You know, and I'm like, wow, well, that's, that's some serious business. When we return, the test results come back, and Stefan's mother slips into a coma. After years of fighting to secure his evidence for DNA testing, Stefan Cowens is finally granted access in the fall of 2003. But his mother is in the hospital, getting weaker by the day. With the test results still weeks away, Stefan can only hope she'll hang on long enough to see him exonerated. This was her biggest stress right here, knowing that I'm in prison. Seemed like she deteriorated little by little over the years, and the last three years were very bad. Then Stefan receives a phone call. His mother has slipped into a coma, and the doctors don't think she'll make it. He said, well, you know, that's basically the only way you can go see your, your, your parents in, in the hospital is if they're, they're close to dying. Stefan must now make a painful choice. They made him choose to either come to the funeral or go to the hospital. And I said, well, I'd rather see my mother warm and still alive, even though she can't see me or hear me. Stefan chooses to visit his mother in the hospital. I mean, I went to the hospital for 10 minutes or maybe even five minutes. They let me stay there. 
It gave us a warning not to be at the hospital, not to come near the hospital while they were there with him. I was so sad for Stefan because no one should have to go through that by themselves. I just made peace. I just went in there and just said my goodbyes because I knew she wasn't coming out of that. Three days later, Stefan's mother passes away. And on September 9th, we turned off the respirator. <laughs> then she died. My, my mother, she was tired. You know, she was just... You know, she was, she was tired. After his mother's funeral, Stefan is faxed paperwork to sign for his mother's cremation. Four weeks after her death, Stefan gets the test results. His mother would have been overjoyed to see them. The DNA found on the hat and the glass mug belongs to the same individual, but not to Stefan Cowens. They've got testable DNA from the brim, the sweatband on the baseball cap, and from a swab from the drinking glass that the perpetrator drank from. So both items found in different locations at the scenes of the crime did not match Stefan. We couldn't have asked for anything more exciting and wonderful. But it isn't enough to free him. The prosecution still has the evidence of the fingerprint left at the crime scene. The Boston Police Department testify that that fingerprint belonged to Stephen Collins. It was still the fingerprint issue. It was always the fingerprint. I was told that uh, this D these DNA test results didn't mean that Stefan Collins was going to be walking out of prison anytime soon. But how is it possible that the fingerprint matches, but the DNA doesn't? It really should cause us to reconsider how reliable fingerprint evidence is. In fact, fingerprint analysis is surprisingly subjective. In many ways, fingerprint analysis is, is more of an art than a science. Uh, the, the, people can't even agree on the standards that should be applied to when there is a direct match. You know, fingerprint identification basically um, is a method of identifying points of comparison on, on two prints. The, the real difference is that some jurisdictions uh, were requiring 30 points of identity. Other jurisdictions were requiring 16. Other jurisdictions said 12. And there are many police officers that are doing fingerprint analysis that don't have adequate training. Disputing the fingerprint evidence, the Innocence Project presents Stefan's conflicting DNA test results to the court. We ended up getting um, ourselves before the court at this point. We had what we believe was compelling evidence of innocence. But the prosecution is determined to keep Stefan behind bars. And they went through the whole thing, explaining why this fingerprint matched his fingerprint. But I felt that we were in a very good position to question the reliability of the fingerprint evidence. Rob was such a little guy with such a big voice. He knew what he was doing, and he knew what he had to say, and he did not stumble over anything. The judge decides not to release the bond, but expresses concern over the clashing scientific evidence. Because all of a sudden you had DNA evidence which was in direct conflict with the fingerprint match. Based on the powerful DNA evidence, the judge sets cash bail for Stefan at $7,500 and schedules a hearing for March 2004 to determine if a new trial is in order. The court authorized us to get access to all the fingerprint material so we could have that reanalyzed by experts. Up next, a stunning discovery stops everyone in their tracks. The DA said today his office did the right thing. After fighting for six years to prove his innocence from behind bars, Stefan Cowan's DNA evidence is finally tested. And the test results are just what he had hoped for. The DNA came back to exclude Stefan Cowens. But Stefan's fight isn't over. The fingerprint, the only evidence that can challenge DNA, still looms over his case. 
we had been asking over and over during this time, let's send it to someone neutral to re-examine it. That never happens because something else does. Something completely unexpected. Within days of the court allowing us to look at the fingerprint evidence, the, the real, you know, the, the print itself, we received a call. And that day, they opened my cell when it wasn't even, you know, time for the cells to open. They said, well, Kyle, would you got an emergency court date? I'm like, what's this about? The prosecution tells Cowan's team something startling. The evidence that was offered in 1997 regarding fingerprint evidence was in fact wrong. The fingerprint used to convict Cowan's does not belong to him. I can conclusively and unequivocally state, Your Honor, that that, that purported match was a mistake. It wasn't a shock to me because I knew this six and a half years ago, you know. It all along was exactly what Stefan had said. It was just some, some, some problem with the fingerprint that he couldn't explain. But it wasn't Stefan's and uh, it was a powerful moment. Stefan Cowens is released immediately. And finally he greets his family as a free man. We all rushed to the courthouse and that's when, uh, it's like a miracle. And they rushed me upstairs where he was there and they were just happy tears from there, happy tears. He was like, I told you they couldn't keep me, sis. I told you they couldn't that keep me. That is what kept him going. The 33-year-old is free today after six and a half years in jail. Once you know that you're innocent of something, you, you keep living and trying to survive each day to prove that. The district attorney, the Boston Police Department, make a public apology to Stefan. Seven years ago, the criminal justice system failed Stephen Collins. An innocent man had spent more than seven years in prison for a crime that he didn't commit. So I felt it was important to you know, let the public know of this uh, you know, terrible mistake. The state of Massachusetts made an apology, but the guy that got shot haven't apologized yet. The decent thing to do was to, to be, you can't give him six years back, but to at least apologize. I mean, I don't think that's asking a lot. But the overriding question on everyone's mind is this. How had two police experts match Stefan's print to a glass he never touched? The analysis that was done was just flat out dead wrong. And why that is, we don't yet know the full story. Here's a fingerprint that two analysts, not one, two analysts at the Boston Police Department said had 16 points of identity. Doesn't sound too right. Sound suspect, right? This is a fraud, or it's just complete incompetence. The Boston law officials seem to think so, too. When the fingerprint evidence proved to be false and wrong, uh, we were shocked and surprised. Acting Commissioner Jim Hussey uh, ordered that the uh, fingerprint unit be audited. I have authorized an independent external audit of the unit's procedures and protocols. The two officers who provided the testimony that the print belonged to Stefan Cowens are placed on leave and put under investigation. They've convened a grand jury and there's witnesses that are being subpoenaed to testify. And we hope to find out what, what exactly went wrong. There's something wrong going on in the Boston Police Department. Has Stefan Cowens been wrongly convicted because of an honest mistake? Or had he been the victim of something more sinister? When we return. More than six years, Stefan Cowens claimed his innocence from behind bars, vehemently protesting the fingerprint evidence used to convict him. Then, in a jolting turn of events, the prosecution discovers the fingerprint does not belong to Stefan. In February of 2004, Stefan Cowens is officially exonerated, and his case continues to send shockwaves through the Boston Police Department. The two officers who gave sworn testimony that Cowens' print was found at the crime scene are placed under grand jury investigation. 
and it was in fact a fingerprint of what we call an elimination print. It was someone who had very good reason to touch the glass. It wasn't even the perpetrator's fingerprint. The thumbprint that had been identified as Stefan Cowan's actually belongs to the woman whose house the perpetrator had entered. They put um, Stefan's name on someone else's card. That's from my understanding. The woman's fingerprint card had been mislabeled with Stefan's name. But that's all authorities can uncover. Truth be told, you know, we still don't exactly know what happened. Independent fingerprint experts cannot conceive of how the two prints were erroneously switched. But the grand jury does not have enough evidence to bring criminal charges against the two officers in question. Everything happens for a reason, and everything has its purpose in life. And um, I truly believe that that was my purpose in life, was to go through that. It's about my case helping other people now. You know? And today, Massachusetts law officials are working hard to reform the system. You know, I've taken the, the philosophical position that when any defendant asks for post-conviction DNA testing of items, that I will go along with that. Secondly, I've convened a uh, working group on the issue of eyewitness identification to come up with ideas, procedures, better or best practices on how we do this. But if it were not for Stefan Cowan's determination and help from the Innocence Project, Stefan would still be facing 30 more years in prison. And I'm grateful to them. I think that it was my mother working up there some too. I just wished his mama was here. I just wish she was here because she fought so hard with this. Everyone in the kitchen? Thank you, Father, for everything you do for us today and every day to come. Thank you, Father, for letting us be here. Amen. Amen. So I was fortunate in a lot, in a lot of ways in prison, you know, just to have family, good lawyers who, you know, who's working, you know, diligently on my case. I just hope he can get on his way with his life and make a better life for himself and achieve some of the things that he thought he wanted in life. Remember when you get caught on fire? <laughs> All the hair got on fire. What's your name again? He's trying to get his barbering license because he said he wants to open his own barber shop. He's working with my cousin Jamie and he's enjoying it. It's a really nice shop. <laughs> you always were fascinated with hair. And give him a pass scissors, and if you don't watch out, he would cut your hair. You know, I just want to just live a productive life. <laughs> you got to set your goals realistically that way. You know, you can achieve each step. <laughs> it's like your, your, your goals way up here, but there's no stairs. But if you set it step by step, you know, you can climb.